Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, the first uh, RAL seminar of 2022. I hope you all are doing well. Uh, welcome to those of you who are both in the, in the Zoom room and those who are watching the live stream online. My name is Jared Lee. I'm a project scientist here in RAL and the RAL seminar coordinator for this year. Um, so just a, an advertisement before we get going. Um, if you would like to give a RAL seminar or if you know, or if you have a colleague um, uh, who would like to give a RAL seminar or, or who would make a good candidate for one, uh, just uh, drop me an email. My email is jaredlee at ucard.edu. Um, so just a couple of uh, housekeeping details before we get going. So we'll be taking questions both uh, from scientists in the Zoom room and from uh, people watching online through the Slido platform. So if you are watching the live stream online, uh, down a little bit below, if you scroll down the page, um, you, below the video, you should see the Slido form. Uh, so you can drop questions there. Uh, we do ask that you please use your name so that we know who's asking the question. And if you're in the Zoom room, um, you can either indicate in the chat that you have a question or use the raise hands feature. And to get to that, uh, in the bottom toolbar, you should see reactions, click on that button, and then uh, you should see an option for raise hand. And I'll be monitoring both um, those who are raising hands in the Zoom room and questions on the Slido, and we'll try to get to uh, questions from both um, as long as there is time. So with all those housekeeping details out of the way, I'd like to turn things over now to Curtis Walker to introduce our speaker. Thank you so much, Jared, and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, I know Dr. Dana Tobin was really hoping to come to NCAR in person, um, but we will nevertheless settle for the online format. Um, so Dr. Tobin is currently a Peter Lamb postdoctoral fellow at the University of Oklahoma in the Cooperative Institute for Severe and High Impact Weather Research and Operations. That's a mouthful, um, formerly known as SIMS. And she's working currently with Dr. Heather Reeves, who leads the surface transportation group there. Um, Dana received her PhD in meteorology and atmospheric science at the Pennsylvania State University in 2021, working under Dot Matt uh, Kumjian. And her research interests are at the realm of winter precipitation, including polarimetric radar detection, microphysical modeling, and societal impacts of winter precipitation. And so her current work that she'll share with us today is related to research looking at weather conditions that lead up to fatal wintertime vehicular crashes, the public facing messaging of deadly winter weather, and the impacts of freezing precipitation on traffic volumes. Um, so with that, Dana, the floor is yours, take it away. All right, thank you, Curtis. Um, you can hear and see me okay, right? Just quick thumbs up. Um, all right, well, I'll just go ahead and get started. Uh, yes, thank you so much. Um, okay. So I, the first thing I want to do is actually apologize for the very long title that I sent out um, and also kind of explain a little bit why I have two very completely different topics kind of jam packed into um, one presentation. Um, so, the research, so the reason for that is that I have kind of two main themes or threads of research um, that I've looked at. Um, the first being uh, road weather and transportation impacts of winter weather. And the second being polarimetric observations and microphysical modeling of ice pellets. Um, so I know that um, some people in the audience are interested in one or both of these topics. Um, so I wanted to make sure that I catered my talk to um, people who are in the audience. So I wanted to include um, both of those different uh, topics. Um, so then the next question is, how are these two seemingly different acts um, related? Um, so I would say that they both contribute to the goal of improving safety during winter weather. So Act 1, uh, focusing on the road weather, um, we're, we are going to identify what weather conditions um, lead to fatalities, uh, determine which winter precipitation types are most hazardous, uh, and also determine what messaging tactics and verbiage should be used um, in order to increase driver awareness and promote safe driving. Um, for the second act, um, looking at ice pellets, um, we, if we are able to improve the detection of ice pellets and also distinguish them from freezing rain or snow, um, we want to do this because each precipitation type actually poses a unique hazard, uh, particularly to surface transportation. Um, 
And we also want to improve the detection of supercooled liquid water drops aloft, um, which obviously are an aviation hazard. Um, so act one, um, the weather conditions and messaging associated with fatal crashes. Um, so this work is actually from my postdoc um, that I'm working on currently. We have a, a paper that's in review that's been conditionally accepted to Weather Climate and Society. Um, so my co-authors are Heather Reeves um, and, and two other members of our team, Andrew Rosnow and Macy Gibson. Um, so I first want to start off with a little bit of background information to kind of motivate this project and give a flavor of some of the work um, that's been done previously about how weather um, actually affects motor vehicle crashes. Um, so over 800 fatalities occur annually on U.S. roadways um, in winter precipitation, and these fatalities are um, higher than any um, than the deaths that occurred during all other weather-related hazards combined. So, for example, during tornadoes or floods or hurricanes, all those fatalities combined still do not equate to the um, fatalities that occur on roadways. Um, so, a little background is that uh, crash and injury rates are higher during winter precipitation than during rain. So during snow, you have about an 84% increase in the crash rates and a 75% increase in the injury rates. And these are obviously higher than the increases in those uh, crash and injury rates that occur during rainfall. Um, and also uh, crash rates generally increase uh, with precipitation intensity. Um, so part of my work um, for my PhD that I won't get into uh, today, uh, but just to kind of summarize it, is that the type of winter precipitation can actually influence crash risk. So for example, um, crash risk during ice pellets and freezing precipitation is greater than during snowfall. And we found that the crash risk is actually highest during freezing precipitation. Um, so reduced visibility can also increase crash risk and severity. So for example, if there's fog or if there's blowing or falling snow, that can uh, significantly limit visibility. Um, and even if a driver can overcome those slick roads, the crash risk is, is still going to be elevated if there's poor visibility. Um, and the reason being that um, reduced visibility is actually decreased just the area in front of your vehicle that you have um, available to you to actually be able to see and react to hazards. Um, so one paper a couple of years ago found that 64% of fatal um, chain reaction crashes, so these large multi-vehicle pileups, um, had at least 50% visibility reduction in the hour leading up to the crash. Um, so the motivating, the motivating questions for this project um, are the following. The first one being, um, what were the weather conditions leading up to fatal crashes? Um, often studies only look at the weather conditions at the time of the crash. So we wanna know what's occurring prior to these crashes happening. And we also wanna know if the weather conditions had a National Weather Service um, winter weather watch morning or advisory attached to them. Uh, so we wanna know if the National Weather Service deemed these weather conditions to be hazardous for motorists. Um, and we also want to know what road hazard messaging was disseminated by the National Weather Service um, and pretty much being able to determine what um, information motorists are being told about for these hazardous road conditions. And also to um, take a look at what should the public be told. Um, so for this project, I took a look at 12 years of um, fatal crashes um, that were uh, obtained from the FARS or the Fatality Analysis Reporting System which is a database maintained by NHTSA. Um, and it's a census of all fatal crashes that occur on public roadways um, since 1975. So the information that's included in this database um, are the date, time, location, the number of fatalities, uh, and all sorts of other um, uh, conditions um, related to the fatalities, including atmospheric conditions and roadway surface conditions. So we coined the term, well, we didn't coin it, um, but we, we determined um, that winter weather related fatalities are going to be those that occur um, if the roadway surface condition is icy, snowy, or slushy, or if the atmospheric conditions um, include snow, sleet, or freezing precipitation. Um, so here's just a map of where um, fatalities occurred um, in that 12 year period. Um, we had about 12,000 fatalities that occurred over that period within the CONUS. Um, so about 1,000 fatalities each year. Um, so the distribution of these fatalities is um, pretty much where you would expect. So aligning with population density and also um, with major roadways and uh, where winter um, weather occurs most frequently. Um, 
So the first part of the project is to identify precipitation types uh, during and preceding fatal crashes, and also to see how the weather conditions in general are leading up to um, those fatal crashes. So we define a pre-crash a pre and crash periods, um, which are two hours each that are back to back. The crash period is the two hour period centered on the crash time. Um, and within each of those periods, we look at the weather information from all ASOS locations within 20 miles of the fatal crash. And this uh, distance was established as being reasonable to look at weather conditions for fatal crashes. Um, and we're only gonna use um, crashes that had precipitation reported during the pre-crash or crash period to take a look at recent precipitation. Um, so we define precipitation type categories um, for each of these periods as SN, as uh, only snow is reported during the entire two hour period. Um, rain, RA, if only rain. Um, MX, if um, ice pellets or a mixture that does not include freezing precipitation occurred. Um, FZ, if freezing precip or freezing precipitation mixture occurred. And NP, or no precipitation, if no precipitation was reported. Um, so, with this analysis, um, only 44% um, of the total fatalities were included in this analysis. Um, and so from this, we determined that most of the fatalities occurred during snowfall, um, about 46.2% of them. And then the second largest fraction was in the MX category of about 30% of fatalities. And this was true for most regions, except for the South, in which case there was um, the, the highest fraction was during FZ. And this makes sense because the ratio of snow to freezing rain um, reports in ASOS is actually smaller um, than other regions in the south. Um, and we also determined that 8% of fatalities had no precipitation occurring um, during the crash period, which indicates that there's a lingering risk um, of crashes after precipitation ends. Um, so the next thing we want to do is look at how precipitation type categories change. Um, leading up to the crash uh, period. So in this example here, um, in the pre-crash period, we have snow beginning. So that would classify the pre-crash period as, as SN. And then in the crash period, um, there was, it was snowing throughout. So that would classify the crash period as SN as well. Um, so that would be a consistent precipitation type category change. Um, and that indicates the precipitation began at least one hour prior to the crash. Um, so just to take a look at what the pre-crash um, precipitation type categories were for each of the um, crash period precipitation types um, for SN crashes, um, about 75% of them had snow. Um, so that means that snow began at least an hour prior to the crash, uh, which is an indicative of ongoing snowfall. And less than 8% had snow that began within an hour of the crash. Um, for rain, uh, MX and the FZ categories, 60% um, of them had consistent precipitation type categories, which again suggests the ongoing and consistent precipitation types for these, um, for these crashes. And about 15 to 20% had no precipitation in the pre-crash period, which is a larger percentage than, during, um, than for the snowfall uh, crashes, which again indicates that precipitation began only within an hour of the crash. Um, I just want to kind of emphasize for the FZ crashes that this, this indicates that 40% of fatalities had freezing precipitation that was only first reported within an hour of the crash. So this suggests that motorists um, only first encountered freezing precipitation right around the time that these crashes happened. So that suggests that the onset of freezing precipitation could be an important factor um, for many of these crashes. Um, so we also wanna look at how other weather conditions um, changed leading up to fatal crashes. Um, so for example, precipitation intensity, visibility and obscurations. Um, and these observations are primarily tied to visibility changes. So that's kind of what we're trying to focus on is how visibility changes um, leading up to these crashes. Um, so we define changes between the pre-crash and crash periods as deteriorating, improving, and consistent. Uh, so just to kind of go over what those categories mean, if it's deteriorating, that means precipitation or obscurations are beginning. Uh, precipitation intensity is increasing and um, or obscurations are worsening or visibility is reducing at least 25%. 
So the opposite is true for the improving category. So for example, precipitation or obscurations end, um, or if visibility increases at least 25%. Um, and we also have a subcategory of fair, um, if no precipitation occurred and no obscurations occurred and visibility is at least five um, session miles. And then if it's, a, if it's consistent, if um, precipitation during the pre-crash and crash periods, um, uh, if there is precipitation during those periods and visibility changes are less than 25%. Um, so the result from this is that about 6% weren't classified, 20% um, were with consistent weather, 33% um, had improving weather conditions, and 42% had deteriorating weather conditions. Um, so this suggests that adverse changes in weather um, can play a role in many of these fatal crashes. Um, and that driving conditions are not always improving um, despite improving weather conditions. So for example, only a quarter of the improving category had actually improved to fair weather. So this again indicates um, that the, there are, there's lingering um, road hazard after the weather is actually cleared out. Um, so the second part of this project is to assess whether the National Weather Service um, had issued any watch warnings or advisories um, for the winter weather conditions associated with fatal crashes. Um, and also kind of take a look at what the um, road hazard messaging was, um, if it was disseminated to the public um, in their standard National Weather Service uh, text products. Um, so the first question we want to answer is how many fatalities had a WSW. So a WSW is, again, the Winter Weather Warning Watch or Advisory. Um, and this could be a winter storm warning, a blizzard warning, um, a snow squall warning, um, any of those um, possible products. And we had to, we determined that um, it, we would only count them if the fatal crash occurred exactly within a WSW. So the reported crash location and time is exactly within the polygon and the valid times of that warning. Um, so CONUS wide, um, only a third of fatalities had a WSW. Um, and of those fatalities, um, of the total fatalities, 6.1% of them had a warning as opposed to an advisory level. So this indicates that the, ma um, the majority of these fatalities either didn't have a warning at all, or if they had some sort of warning, it was most, most likely a, an advisory level um, warning on them. Um, so this was generally consistent across the U.S., um, except in the South and Southeast, um, more than half of fatalities had a WSW, which is consistent with the National Weather Service having lower thresholds when they do issue these warnings and advisories. Um, so the first thing that I want to say is that this should not be interpreted as the National Weather Service um, kind of missing any of these hazardous weather conditions. Um, because not all fatalities are actually caused by the winter weather hazard. Um, so what this does mean instead is that most fatal crashes are occurring uh, during weather conditions that don't have a WSW. So the weather doesn't um, either doesn't meet the issuance criteria or the winter weather has possibly ended. Um, and the next thing is that the winter storm warnings don't inherently uh, convey any sort of road hazard to motorists. You know. Um, so we don't we want to see what WSWs actually include as far as road hazard messaging and also um, just determine what that messaging looks like. Um, so we, we examined a large number of these WSWs and found that all of them include two things. They include the identification of a road hazard. So, for example, um, be prepared for slippery roads and limited visibilities. Roads will become slick and hazardous. And then the second thing that they include is some sort of precautionary action item for motorists. So for example, slow down and use caution while driving or avoid travel if at all possible. Um, some WSWs had additional components. Um, so some of them had specific mentions of anticipated hazards or some sort of compounding risk factors. Um, so if rapidly changing weather conditions were anticipated, that might be included. Or if freezing precipitation was um, anticipated um, there might be some emphasis on um, the hazard, primarily with bridges, overpasses, um, sidewalks, and untreated surfaces. And also, if the winter weather is occurring during rush hour commutes, um, that might also be included in these WSWs. Um, one thing that we noticed that there's was that there's no clear indication of any sort of like tiered um, road hazard or impact rating. Um, so, for example, hazardous versus very hazardous versus extremely hazardous um, don't click 
that don't very clearly convey any sort of hazard um, rating for motorists. You know, for example, we don't know like what should a motorist do if it says extremely hazardous roads? Um, and is that different from it just being a normally hazardous road? Um, so this indicates that the absence of a WSW does not imply that there are no road hazards. Um, and so we would like to advocate that road hazards should be messaged for sub WSW conditions. Um, so for example, you, the use of social media or other messaging um, platforms would be advisable. Um, so now that we have a sense for the type of language that's included in these um, WSWs. I want to take a look at some other what other types of messaging might be useful in the future. So we looked at what non weather related attributes are common for um, these fatal winter weather crashes and to, to determine if they're different from crashes in non adverse weather conditions. Because uh, this could provide insight as far as what additional messaging um, might be helpful to use in the future. Um, so two thirds of these um, fatalities that occurred during winter weather occurred on highways. And this is a statistically significantly greater percentage um, of fatalities that occur on highways um, compared to during non adverse weather conditions. Um, so this suggests that the use of variable um, message highway signs might be effective to kind of target motorists um, where they're more susceptible to um, having these fatal crashes and also to warn them of weather and road conditions. 49% um, of fatalities involve only one vehicle, um, but we also found that single vehicle fatalities on highways are less likely to occur during winter weather as opposed to during non adverse conditions. So this suggests that there's a shift in the number of uh, in fatal crashes involving more than one vehicle. Um, so this makes sense that there should be some sort of justifiable concern. Um, to watch out for other drivers on the roadways, but still also keeping in mind that half of fatalities occur when there's only one driver involved. So other motorists are not always to blame for these crashes. Um, so some potential culprits um, for the involvement of other vehicles could be that um, people are following too closely on slick roads. Um, there could be limited visibilities or if drivers are unable to maintain their lane while driving. So they could be moving into other um, adjacent lanes or onto it into opposing traffic. Um, so, so considering this, um, possible messaging could be to leave even more space between vehicles, uh, to slow down and help maintain control of uh, vehicles, and also to advise proper strategies for motorists to regain control of their vehicle if they do lose control. Um, we noted that 19% of fatalities involved the truck, um, and this percentage was higher than during non-adverse weather conditions. Um, which makes sense because the ratio of trucks to passenger cars actually increases during winter weather. Um, but we did find that 90% of fatalities that involve a truck also involve at least one more vehicle. Um, and we compare this result to 42% of um, fatalities involving only passenger cars involve at least one vehicle. So some possible messaging could be to allow even more space if trucks are on the roadways and also to remain out of their blind spots. Um, lastly, 56% uh, of fatalities involve speeding, um, either driving above the limit or driving too fast for conditions. And um, fatalities are five to six times as likely to involve speeding on highways in winter weather. Um, but we, have, we determined that driving above the speed limit um, is less likely to occur in winter weather, um, which suggests that drivers are driving below the speed limit, but still driving faster than conditions allow. Um, so potential messaging could be just to urge motorists to slow down even more than they normally would. Um, so future work in this um, avenue could be to um, continue, continue the identification of road hazards um, to determine crash risk of various weather hazards, and also to um, improve the language used to communicate road hazards and calls to action. Um, so for example, determining what language and tactics might work best to communicate road hazards, and also what language um, would actually make motorists do something different as they're driving. Okay, so now switching gears um, to act two, uh, kind of part two of the talk is a polar metric and microphysical investigation of ice pellets. So this work um, was primarily from my PhD work at Penn State. Um, we have one paper that came out last year 
And then we have one more that I'm still working on. Uh, I hope to be finishing that up soon. Um, so some co-authors, um, obviously Matt Kumjian was a co-author on both papers, um, but for the paper that's um, soon to be submitted, we have Marco Wei and um, Pablo Escolias um, as co-authors on that. Um, so hopefully everyone's familiar with ice pellets. Um, I like to call them a snow lover's least favorite frozen precipitation type. Um, if I find them to be my favorite precipitation type. Um, so just a quick schematic of the two different pathways um, that we can get ice pellets. Um, first is that we begin with um, snowflakes that melt either fully or partially uh, within a warm layer aloft. And then if the particles are fully melted, they have to nucleate at some point um, within the subfreezing layer um, before they can start to refreeze. Because otherwise, if they don't nucleate, obviously that would, re would result in freezing precipitation. Um, and if they're partially melted, they still contain some sort of ice nucleus in them. So they're already active and they can start to refreeze it right when, um, right within that, uh, the top of that subfreezing surface layer. Um, so I don't want to go into too much um, detail as an overview, um, but here's just a quick um, summary of the polymetric radar variables um, that I'll be talking about. Um, so if you're not super familiar uh, with them, um, you can still follow along because I like to show like a physical explanation of what they mean. Um, so for ZH, uh, the radar reflectivity factor, horizontal polarization, um, it's related to particle concentrate, sorry, um, particle concentration, size, and composition. So a ZH of a liquid particle is going to be greater than ZH of an ice particle. ZDR is the differential radar uh, reflectivity. Um, and um, it's related to particle shape and composition. Um, KDP is the specific differential phase, which is also related to particle shape um, composition, but also concentration. So um, ZDR and KDP of uh, an oblate liquid particle is going to be greater than that of an ice particle. Um, but also, if a particle is more oblate, um, it will have higher ZDR and KDP than a spherical particle, particle of the same composition. Um, LDR is the linear depolarization ratio. It's related to um, particle shape, orientation, and composition. Um, so these particles are canted, so they're wobbling as they're falling. So LDR of a liquid particle is greater than LDR of an ice particle. Um, LDR is also increased if it's non-spherical and wobbling, um, as opposed to if it's spherical. Um, and also if it's wobbling more than another particle, that will increase LDR as well. Um, and then rho HB is the correlation coefficient, um, which is just a measure of the diversity of particle shape, composition, and orientations. Um, so the polarimetric refreezing signature, um, we, we have several expectations for what it might look like um, using polarimetric radar. Um, so we assumed that it would result in reductions in ZH, ZDR, KDP, LDR, and rho HV within the refreezing layer, um, because we're taking these liquid particles and we're freezing them. So that would act to reduce ZH, ZDR, and KDP. And also because um, ZDR would also be decreased because as these particles are freezing, they tend to increase um, wobbling or tumbling as they freeze. So these particles appear more spherical to the radar. Um, so that would decrease ZDR. Um, and also because freezing isn't instantaneous, that would act to reduce rho HB. Um, the reality was a little different. Um, so this is a schematic of the observed um, vertical profiles of the radar variables at side incidence. Um, so particles as viewed from the side. Um, and just showing the typical um, values and ranges that we observed for them for ZH, ZDR, KDP, LDR, and rho HV. Um, and you can see that there is that reduction in uh, ZH and rho HV. But then there's these unexpected enhancements in ZDR, KDP, and LDR that require a little bit more explanation. Um, so the favorite hypothesis for this is that um, these particles were fully melted prior to refreezing. Um, and we say this because they started to refreeze at temperatures less than zero degrees Celsius. So they had to nucleate at some other temperature, typically around negative five degrees Celsius before they could freeze. Um, so the favorite hypothesis was that there was preferential refreezing of small drops. Uh, doing so actually increases the relative contribution of the larger drops to ZH. 
And these drops intrinsically have higher ZDR values because they tend to be oblate um, due to drag influences as they fall. Um, but the shortcoming for this hypothesis is that it doesn't explain the KDP enhancement that's observed. Um, so we can test um, this idea of preferential refreezing uh, with just a very simple test uh, by sequentially freezing a liquid distribution um, from small to large bins. And then with each new frozen bin, we compute the polarimetric um, variables for each frozen bin. Um, and the result is um, here plotted for ZDR. So as we go from an all liquid distribution on the left to the all ice distribution, it actually increases um, ZDR. So there's a maximum ZDR enhancement when the lower, the smaller half or smaller part of the uh, distribution is frozen and the largest particles are still liquid. Um, but the problem with that test is that it's not entirely realistic because refreezing is actually more gradual across a particle size distribution. Um, so what we did was we um, developed a microphysical model and coupled it with a polarimetric radar forward operator to refreeze drops um, more realistically and also to simulate the corresponding polarimetric radar profiles. Um, and because we don't know exactly how particle tumbling behaves as these particles freeze, um, we have two, uh, two different assumptions. One is that there is an increase in the particle wobbling with freezing. And then the second one is that there's no increase in that wobbling with freezing. Um, so the microphysical model, um, it was that same, we use that same liquid particle size distribution that I showed before. Um, and we discretized it from 0 0.1 to 4 millimeter um, uh, drop diameters um, in 0 0.1 millimeter bins. And we used idealized one dimensional steady state precipitation column of that particle size distribution. And we nucleate all drops at negative five degrees Celsius. And we assume radially symmetric um, freezing equation. So we start with a liquid drop. It starts to freeze from the outside in with this very symmetric ice shell. Um, the radar uh, forward operator, um, we assume that these particles are now going to be oblate spheroids. So we take these spherical particles and kind of squish them a little bit. Um, and um, we assume that the freezing drops have ice shells and inner uh, slushy cores. So they have some ice and some liquid in them. And we assume that the um, axis ratio of the inner particle and the outer particle are identical. Um, so on the left here is the um, temperature and dew point uh, uh, profile um, that we use for the simulation. Um, again, we nucleate these drops at negative five degrees Celsius. Um, and on the right here is the uh, liquid water mass fraction of the simulation, um, where the dark gray is the liquid drops, the um, light gray is completely frozen ice pellets, and everything else is colored um, according to the color bar. Um, and we can see that the very smallest drops freeze very quickly, and then the larger drops um, are not quite completely frozen by the time that they hit the surface. Um, so results from this um, is that um, ZH and ZDR, sorry, ZH and rho HV do behave as expected. We have this decrease in ZH and this reduction in rho HV. Um, but then we're not getting that ZDR enhancement that we got for the simple refreezing test. Um, and the reason for this is that the ice shell um, that's forming on these larger particles has a decreasing influence on ZDR that's actually um, going to be overwhelming the increasing influence that the oblate shape has on ZDR. And also because the simple refreezing tests uh, kept those large drops liquid, whereas here they have started to form an ice shell around them. Um, so because that simple uh, preferential refreezing um, hypothesis didn't produce any of the observations um, for the profiles in ZDR or KDP, um, we developed a new hypothesis. Uh, we wondered what would happen if the ice shell is not um, freezing uh, symmetrically. So for example, there is um, more favorable heat transfer on the bottom of a falling and ventilated particle which results in more rapid freezing of, um, on the bottom of the particle and resulting in a thicker ice shell on the bottom. Um, and we also know that symmetric freezing rates around the particle are only um, achieved if the particle is tumbling. Um, so we wanted to test this new hypothesis um, 
in our model um, by modeling the inner spheroid with a lower axis ratio than the exterior of the particle. Um, so our model was limited by the concentric spheroid scattering model. Um, so what we did in this case was just distribute the liquid core um, more along the major axis of the particle. So we simulate a thicker ice shell on the bottom of a particle, um, but we also simulate a thicker ice shell on the top of the particle, um, just as a result of this limitation. Um, so we had uh, two different um, approximations. The first is an extreme um, axis ratio, which basically maximizes this effect. We continue to have um, the inner slushy core um, maintaining contact with the exterior of the particle. So that's just stretching this liquid core um, as far as it can go within the particle, which is obviously unrealistic once these particles um, freeze um, more completely. And then a more moderate axis ratio that you can see on the right, um, which starts to freeze from the sides in as well. Um, so here's the results um, from these simulations. Um, again, there's four of them because we have the increased wobbling versus consistent wobbling, and also the two um, axis ratio assumptions, the moderate and the extreme. Um, so what you can see is that we were actually able to produce the ZDR, KDP, and LDR enhancements. Um, and what's nice is that it even matches up with the respective heights of these. So for example, the KDP enhancement is higher than the ZDR enhancement, which is slightly higher than the LDR enhancement. And we were able to um, replicate this. Um, another thing that I wanna know is that um, the consistent wobbling is actually going to maximize the ZDR and KDP enhancements. So for example, these solid lines as opposed to the dashed lines, but that comes at the expense of the LDR enhancement. So for example, the LDR enhancement is maximized if, um, if the particles do increase their wobbling, because again, that's going to increase LDR of these particles. Um, so the reason for this um, and why it's able to replicate these profiles is because of that distribution of the liquid core, um, especially for the large particles, um, because it's primarily um, aligned along the major axis of the particle, which is contributing to those LDR enhancements. Um, and the increased wobbling um, is detrimental to the signature because it means that the liquid core is not as well aligned with the horizontal axis as if the particle is just wobbling a little bit um, and it's fairly consistent in, in its wobbling. Um, and then we do get that reduction in um, all these variables, again, um, once a significant portion of the particle size distribution has completely frozen. Um, so for now, that kind of puts us in a good place um, for the refreezing of these fully melted hydrometers. Um, but we, now we wanna know what happens if um, the snowflakes did not melt completely prior to refreezing. Um, so we have data from the um, CASPER um, radar in at Sony Brook University. It's a KA band um, radar that's fully polarimetric and is a Doppler radar. Um, and we have data from um, an event on 17 December 2019, uh, which is an ice pellet and rain event. Um, and what I plotted here is um, the variables um, for in, in black is from the Casper radar. Uh, these are uh, quasi vertical profiles. Um, so basically what I was showing before. Uh, but actual data as opposed to the um, schematic that I showed. Um, and then in the lighter blue, uh, thinner lines is the, out, is the profiles from the nearby S-band um, KOKX radar on Long Island. Um, so what we can see here is that there's, we're not getting that same refreezing signature in the QVPs. So within this refreezing layer, we get this decrease in ZH ZDR and LDR, and actually just a straight increase in rho HV with freezing. Um, so the great thing about this radar is that it um, was able to collect um, vertically pointing radar data. So that gave us information about particle fall speeds and also the polarimetric um, data that's viewed um, as these particles are viewed from below. Um, so what I plotted here is Z and LDR values um, within about 0.16 meter per second velocity bins. Um, 
with the convention being that negative values um, are increasing fall speeds as these particles are falling towards the radar. Um, so we can see that melting is indicated by the increase in Z and LDR as the liquid mass of these particles increases and also in an increase in these fall speeds as these light fluffy particles um, melt so that their, in, uh, their density increases and their fall speeds adjust closer to raindrops. Um, so in the teal region here, we see that there's um, actually partially melted snowflakes um, as a result of these elevated Z and LVR values. And it also indicates that these particles haven't collapsed into raindrops, because if, the, if they did collapse into raindrops, um, LDR um, would be around negative 30 dB, which is the system lower limit, because these particles would appear spherical from below. Um, so we know that they have not collapsed because LDR is elevated, um, which makes sense if these uh, snowflakes are irregularly shaped and have no preferred, preferred orientation within the horizontal plane. So as long as they retain that awkward elongated shape that will increase LDR as they start to melt. Um, so beneath that layer in this purple region, we have the refreezing of those um, partially melted snowflakes. We have the decrease in Z and the decrease in LDR that occurs within the slower falling particle bins first, um, which is roughly consistent with um, the smaller particles freezing first, um, which is consistent with um, particles still containing ice within them. Um, so we matched these observations back with the um, polarimetric profiles. Uh, we can see that the polarimetric changes, these decreases in ZH, ZDR, and LDR um, pretty much roughly correspond with this freezing of the particles um, in that region in the spectral data. Um, so these observations uh, were again for the refreezing of melting snowflakes that hadn't fully collapsed into raindrops yet. So we have the decrease in ZH, ZDR, and LDR, um, which we can explain this just by basically what would happen if you took a wetted snowflake and start to freeze it. It would just decrease those values. And we have an increase in rho HV because um, rho HV was already reduced before refreezing. Um, so for example, just think what rho HV does in the melting layer, it's reduced. Um, and it's only increasing because these um, hydrometers are starting to freeze. So they're all freezing, they're all becoming um, more uniform upon freezing. Um, so in summary, it's possible that there are two different polarimetric features for refreezing, one for the fully melted particles, which is more of a uh, classic polarimetric refreezing signature with the localized increase in ZDR, KDP, and LDR. And then another one for the partially melted particles, where we just have simple reductions in ZDR and um, LDR and an increase in rho HV. Um, so the implications for this, if there are in fact two separate um, signatures, is that um, the presence or the lack of this uh, so-called classic uh, polarimetric refreezing signature could indicate the particle species that are undergoing refreezing. Um, so for example, if this signature is present, it indicates that there are supercooled liquid drops um, that are undergoing refreezing as opposed to just partially melted and wetted snowflakes. So again, this could indicate um, a height difference between the two. So on the left, um, we have this classic signature. Um, so freezing is happening at a much lower height than for the partially melted um, refreezing um, signature where uh, refreezing is happening aloft. Um, so the implications for this um, could be important for aircraft. Um, so for example, an aircraft flying through the left um, region here is flying through super cool liquid drops, uh, which could be hazardous um, for them as far as icing considerations. And then um, the airplane on the right does not have these same hazards because they're, um, the particles have already started to freeze. So there's not that threat of icing. Um, so additional uncertainties um, and future work for this is that we don't know what additional role ice crystals could have in the refreezing signature. Um, they could be responsible for initiating refreezing. Um, and also, um, I didn't quite mention this, but um, the presence of ice crystals actually do act to increase that KDP enhancement. Um, 
The last thing is that if asymmetric freezing rates around the particle is producing the refreezing signature, we want to know how often it's actually occurring. Um, we want to know what, what percentage of cases with refreezing of um, fully melted hydrometers also have this uh, classic refreezing signature. Um, and also, we don't know what the signature would look like for partially melted but collapsed particles, um, whether or not that would actually produce um, the classic refreezing signature or if it would kind of revert to the other signature where it's just these um, decreases in all those variables. So the last thing for that is that we want to know if it can reliably detect the presence of supercooled liquid drops uh, beneath the melting layer. Um, so that is all I have. Um, I will take questions. I also put my email up there. And also, if um, you want to get in touch with me through Twitter, I'm available for that. And yeah. Hey, thank you, Dana. Uh, this is a very, um, very informative seminar. Very, very interesting, too. Um, we already have one question. Um, Matthias, would you be willing to unmute your camera and mic? Uh, let's see. I can use my mic, but I'm on a loan a laptop and my camera doesn't okay. work. So apologies for that. No worries. But uh, thank you for, for a very interesting seminar. Obviously, you did a lot of work uh, on different aspects of you know, detecting wintry conditions as well as uh, looking at accident statistics in, and trying to interpret them to what extent they are related to, to uh, weather and whether there were alerts or warnings, et cetera, out there. So my question to you is really, how do you think that your research is helping the National Weather Service meteorologists for better detecting critical wintry conditions and then provide enhanced alerts to drivers out there? Um, I, so I think there, I, I know there are two separate issues. I, I know that the, um, the research for this uh, refreezing signature um, hasn't quite, it's not enveloped into some sort of product yet. So they're, they're not taking a look at this. Um, I, I've looked at it a couple times um, during current winter weather conditions, and I have found that there were the distinction, you know, sometimes there, we know that there were ice pellets and there was a refreezing signature. Other times we saw the ice pellets and there was not this signature. So I could already see um, implications for being able to detect like here at this radar, we have ice pellets. And I know because the refreezing signature, um, but there's a, there's a bit of a gap as far as being able to translate that science into a usable product um, for forecasters. Um, so I know there's a gap there. Um, as far as the um, pushing out weather alerts, um, I know that's, that's obviously something that the Weather Service is actively doing. Um, so where my research is fitting in is just trying to help kind of tailor those um, watch warning advisory um, products and language um, of them to potentially be able to reach motorists um, and let them know like, hey, this is what you should be doing, you know, and maybe maybe watch warning advisories aren't the best location for that. Maybe it is um, using social media, you know, pushing out things, um, you know, for example, images, putting images on, you know, this is a current weather condition um, and this is the precautions that you should take. So potentially that is um, the best avenue towards being able to um, get this research out into the public. Um, so I, I hope that answered. Um, your question a little bit there. Jared, you're muted. Sorry about that. <laughs> Didn't get ever have this figured out. So Roy, next question. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Dana, for the a nice seminar. Um, I have a question for part one and part two. So okay. the question for part one is, you said that visibility reduction and precip intensity increase, uh, both are factors in, in crashes. Which one do you think is, which one do you think is larger? Is it the visibility or is it the intensity or both? 
Um, so it's kind of hard to say. Um, I, I kind of swept this part under the rug, but ASOS um, uses visibility um, in their algorithms to um, output intensity. So it, visibility and precipitation intensity are very um, highly correlated in the actual observations that I used. Um, so it's hard to, to kind of tease them apart. Um, but I guess from personal experience and just kind of looking at like webcam um, images and things like that and thinking about it, I would I would probably say that first and foremost, for, first and foremost, it's visibility. Whether that comes from um, the presence of fog or an increase in um, in precipitation intensity, um, I, I feel like it all kind of comes down to how far ahead can you see um, when you're driving and how fast are you going? Is it, is it relative to those visibility changes? Um, it's probably not, you know, people are still probably driving too fast um, for those conditions. So I think everything um, for the most part comes down to visibility. And then if there is uh, some sort of hazard, it then kind of comes down to what's the road surface condition? Is it slippery? Can you stop in time? Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. I, I think I, I agree with you that visibility is the major factor. But uh, as you know, uh, visibility can be also reduced by changing snow type. So mm -hmm. uh, you might want to look at the odd precipitation gauge on ASOS, which has the liquid equivalent rate, and correlate that with uh, the crashes as well. Okay. So that's, that's an additional data set. So uh, Sorry, Darren, uh, Jared, I'm, I'm asking lots of questions here. On part two, um, you talked a lot about ice pellets and refreezing and fully melting, et cetera, et cetera. There's been a lot of freezing rain studies that have looked at this as well. And you talked about refreezing at one temperature uh, if they're partially melted, and I agree with that, but fully melting, uh, fully melted snow particles, uh, they typically don't refreeze at the same temperature. There's ice nucleation that takes into account, and usually it's the bigger drops that freeze first, not the smaller drops, so you had it just to reverse. So I'm just wondering where that came from. Yeah, so... Um... Um, I, I know, I know that it, it's not always at, um, you know, a single temperature. It's not always just negative five. Um, but from our previous observations, that seemed to be a, a pretty um, consistent uh, temperature. So in the, you know, negative five to negative six degrees Celsius range was where we start to see this refreezing signature. Um, so the only reason uh, that we um, the only reason for the preferential refreezing of these small drops, um, we know it's kind of counterintuitive to what you'd expect. Like you would only get this if they're all nucleated at the same height, which obviously um, is most likely not the case, right? Um, you know, immersion freezing or also even uh, contact nucleation tend to favor the larger drops first. Um, so um, I will... I will show that though. We, we did simulations um, in our paper um, where we simulated, so this is the liquid water mass fraction. Um, if we consider um, that there's also ice crystals and that they are um, contact, um, they're nucleating these larger particles first um, and then the smallest particles just don't get nucleated at all. Um, so as long as we still consider that asymmetric freezing rate around a particle, it's, it's still able to produce um, realistic profiles in ZDR. So we still have the increase in ZDR, KDP, and LDR. Um, we just kind of changed the nucleation um, assumption that we made, and it was still able to produce this. So we're, we weren't as concerned with the nucleation mechanism. We know that that's also another separate mystery that we weren't capable of solving in this project. Um, so that's obviously still up for debate as far as how, how they're actually nucleating in the first place. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, looks mm -hmm. like Lu Lin has some questions, so I will defer to So actually the, the next question goes to Amanda. I'm sorry, I, don't, I couldn't find my little hand to raise. Um, 
Thank you, Dana, for that really interesting talk. I especially enjoyed that you're looking specifically at types of frozen precipitation rather than just snow at a whole. Um, mm -hmm. It's something new in the field, which is great. My question's kind of two part related to the messaging component of your talk. Um, hazardous weather messaging along the roadways really falls under the purview of the Departments of Transportation rather than the National Weather Service. So I was wondering if you had or plan to take a look at the kind of messages that DOTs were putting out during those storms. Um, I noticed you mentioned the uh, dynamic message signs as a potential avenue for some of this messaging. So I was wondering if you have or plan to look at what the DOTs were saying. Um, so I don't know of any data set that would be available for, you know, like at this time, DOTs were messaging X, Y, or Z, um, but we do have um, a grant that would um, kind of bring DOT partners and weather service partners and, and um, kind of like a fo focus group and see like, at what point are you messaging things? When do you message things? Um, so we do have, um, I mean, hopefully that gets funded um, and we can start looking at things like that. Um, another thing that I, I know is that sometimes they only put those um, message signs to use when, uh, when there is a warning. Um, so I, I feel like that's not the best practice that should be used. I feel like maybe those warning, uh, those um, variable message signs should be used at lower thresholds, like lower criteria um, that aren't tied to the warning. You know, maybe there's sub warning criterias, um, you know, like, hey, this is a hazardous road condition. Let's put the warning, uh, let's put the message on the board, even if there's not an actual winter weather warning. Um, so I feel like those are um, two separate things that could be looked at in the future. Do you know specifically which states or agencies do that? Because I know that's not consistent. For example, in Wyoming, they will post things as they find that it reaches the DOT's warning criteria, which is completely different than what the National Weather Service does or other states don't necessarily do that either. Um, so maybe in that focus group, you can kind of do a survey of practice. It, it varies a lot. Yeah, I, I assume it varies. It's, it, I guess it's hard to say what all states do because not none of them make their practices known publicly to be able to look at it. Um, I want to say it was um, I forgot which state it was that I looked at. It was um, maybe Michigan um, that you know they they looked at a, a survey um, as far as like related to the warnings, and then that's when they would start to message on their highway signs. Um, so that's only obviously one sample out of, you know, 50 states in the U.S. Um, that we could we could pull from for that. Okay, thank you. And then sort of related and might be more of a comment than a question, but you mm -hmm. mentioned in one of your messaging um, suggestions was to go slow or go even slower around a truck. And uh, speed harmonization, where vehicles are traveling at a similar speed with each other in the general area, uh, when those speeds are not harmonized, that's when we usually see uh, crashes and fatal crashes. And so one thing DOTs have been doing to try to work with that is um, the introduction of variable speed limits. Um, so if you have looked at variable speed limits, I'd be interested in hearing what you've looked at. And if you haven't, uh, recommend maybe in that focus group if that grant is funded to look at what the results are for um, agencies that were able to implement a variable speed limit if it lowered fatalities or not, because I know that's the goal and um, something they'd be looking for. Yeah, thank you. I, I hadn't um, I hadn't looked into that, so I, I don't have an answer for you, unfortunately. Um, but that, yeah, that's certainly something that I'd, I'd be interested in looking at. Thank you. Great, thank you again, very good talk. Okay, the next question goes to Dave. Hi, Dana. Uh, yeah, great talk. Thanks. Thanks. Hey, Dave, we can barely hear you. Hey, maybe you can hear me now. A little um, bit better. Yeah, so um, Roy asked part of my question already about um, freezing rain. So I'll ask maybe a slightly different question. Um, did, you, did you have to uh, do any work in terms of matching up the beams from the Long Island S-band to the to the K-band and, and secondarily, 
how far, if you were to create an operational product, how far away from an S band do you think this uh, very sensitive um, signature could be used? Yeah, so for, for your first part of your question, um, I, uh, I tried to spatially match each of them. Um, so what I did was, um, it's called uh, range azimuth defined QVPs that we've developed. Um, so we take just a very small um, sector of um, around the radar and only average the data um, within that little little slice, uh, like that uh, slice of the volume. Um, so I, I did make that into, I put it onto just like a common grid that had like 10 meter spacing. Um, and I just matched that with um, the Casper radar. So I didn't do anything as far as the actual beams or anything like that. I just did, um, you know, just standard beam refraction um, for each of them to match up the heights. And then obviously the, um, the height of the radar and elevation was taken into consideration for that. Um, as far as the range away from the radar, um, that that's the tricky part um, because this is such a low level signature to begin with. I mean, we're talking less than, you know, a thousand um, meters on a good day. Um, so we're talking like very close to the radar. Um, I've looked at um, uh, QVPs that take data from as far away as uh, 50 kilometers. Um, but what we do is we are leveraging the, um, the lowest elevation angles as well. Um, so we're not only using the highest elevation ang angles um, to compute these vertical profiles because those tend to actually um, censor out the signature um, altogether. Um, so it's just a blend of, again, the entire radar volume, whatever data is available. Um, so yes, it does have um, sensitivity as far as how far away you can actually use um, the data for it because it could overshoot it. OK, thanks. Okay, and the final question, because of time, the final question will go to Lou Lin. Thank you, Jared. Uh, thank you, Dana, for the great talk. Uh, I don't know uh, if you can hear me or, or see my... Yeah. Um, okay, great. And okay. I think if I had... Uh, uh, Roy asked some of my questions, and, and then I still have some uh, related to the part two. Uh, when you okay. try to explain the uh, behavior of different parameter, the uh, uh, dual pole and all the polarization uh, parameters by as assuming different uh, microphysical processes, I'm curious, have you ever thought of the breakup, uh, uh, breakup process after the melting occur and also like the secondary ice formation after refreezing occur? Because these are, in my opinion, easily get you a lot of other, uh, I would say, uh, points or, or, or angles to actually explain or, or interpret some of those data. So just, uh, uh, just a thought there. Yeah, I mean, I mean great points, obviously. Uh, we did not look at um, particle interactions or breakup um, for our model. We, we literally just took, um, you know, uh, essentially we took ice pellet observations um, and start them you know, as though they were completely melted and they were a one-to-one -one correspondence of a liquid drop freezing into a single ice pellet. So I know, um, obviously, there are um, these complex particle interactions. Um, you know, what happens if if two ice pellets um, come together and stick? Obviously, that's going to um, have implications for the radar profiles that we didn't consider. Um, and obviously, um, if a particle is uh, splintering or, you know, any sort of secondary ice nucleation uh, processes, um, we, we know that's happening. Um, I think we kind of take, a, um, we kind of consider that to be more um, a nucleation issue. Um, I don't know as if it has a significant effect on um, these primary radar variables. So again, if we do have splintering of these particles, that um, the presence of these needles would increase the KDP signal. Um, but I don't know what effect um, in the grand scheme of things it would have on the other ones. Um, so obviously that's um, something to consider in the future. Um, again, we, we didn't we didn't look at it. We were, we were just like bare bones. Take take a liquid drop, freeze it. Let's see what damage we can do as far as actually matching up these profiles. Um, and, and we think we did a 
a pretty decent job um, for, for what we had access to. Sure, uh, very, uh, very appropriate approach at the very beginning. So I just uh, yeah, appreciate that and think it could be some future directions after this discussion. But thank you so much. Absolutely, thank you. All right, well, yeah, thank you once again to Dana for giving just a, a fantastic seminar and thanks for um, everyone here for asking uh, so many questions and uh, it was a really good engaging discussion. Uh, so just a reminder, this, um, this seminar was recorded and in a couple days, it'll be posted on the RAL seminar series webpage where you can also go look at recordings of past seminars and also see the schedule for upcoming seminars. Um, if you have an idea for a seminar or someone to give one, just contact me and we'll uh, get it on the schedule. And um, with that, we'll wrap things up. And thank you for attending both here in the Zoom room and online. And have a good day, everyone. Bye. Thank you.